mean, we rode on Dave Grohl's private jet once. I mean, that's a crazy story. I mean, these Whoa. are stories I tell people I work with. Just they're like, I'm legit. I mean, so I used to be <laughs> legit. You know, I rode on Dave Grohl's private jet once. They're like, no, oh, shit. You know, but I mean, you know, it's like, it's over now. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know he had a private jet. Well, he did on that tour. <laughs> what? In, in, in England, he does very, very well. Really? Um, and this, I mean, this is like 2003. So this is years ago now, six years ago. Um, we flew from Ireland to London. And then in London, the next day was actually on Thanksgiving. And we were on the plane home to Boston. And a flight attendant asked, like, what have you guys been doing all night? I'm like, if we told you, you wouldn't believe us. <laughs> you know, How old were you when you started? You were like 16? I, I joined Cave and I was 15. 15. I'm 30 now. Okay. And when you started this band, or the first few years of the band, were there goals? Were there objectives? Um, yeah, the goals were, I mean, we were very, super duper Converge fans. Oh. And, uh... We kind of wanted, our goal was to play a show with them, really. You know, yeah. that was like, I hope someday we can play a, a show with Converge. <laughs> you know what I mean? Now it's like so funny because we're like, you know, friends with them and, you know, peers with them now. But, uh, you know, that was the goal when we started, you know, play with bands that we like. Cable at the time, Converge, Threadbare, if we ever had a chance. We, we, we enjoy going to like local shows. And, you know, there was like, around that time, there's a heavy duty like Nirvana whole influence of all these like VFW shows where kids were like very grungy, I guess. But then there was a whole nother scene. There's like very, very focused on hardcore and straight edge and vegetarian, whatever, like all the things that are now, you know, hardcore, I don't know what people call hardcore. And, you know, I, I think that was the most appealing to me because it was the most confrontational. And I knew that, you know, that's kind of the, where we wanted to go. I wanted to be a part of it, you know, which is, it's all gone now. You know, this is when we were kids, but that was the goal when we started. You know? What was getting signed to Focus? No. It was no, just it a play. It was, you know, at the time, you know, none of us had families. None of us were married. We didn't like our, our real jobs at all, you know, working shitty jobs. And uh, it just kind of, when Jupiter came out, you know, all of a sudden all these people started sniffing around, you know? Yeah. And uh, we looked at it as an opportunity to, like, you know, see how far we could take it, you know? And it was a good run, and we did a lot of awesome things that I don't think we'll ever do again. You know, we made a corporate rock record, spent a fuckload of money on it, you know, something I'll never do again. You know, uh, yeah. it was an experience, man. You know, I don't regret it. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't a goal of mine. I'm glad I did it, you know, and I don't yearn to be back there at all. I'm very happy in the place that I am now. Um, but no, it wasn't a goal to be signed to a major label at all, whatsoever. I mean, we wanted to put on music, but it was never a goal starting out to be on a major. If anything, it just fumbled, it stumbled upon us, you know, it just kind of just fell into our lap. But we, we were presented with lots of choices, you know. Well, what was the appeal at the time with RCA that made you guys want to sign? Taking back now. Um, at the time, I think it was the guy that we were dealing with. You know, his name was Bruce. I, I think we, he kind of pitched. I mean, they're they kind of like used car salesmen, man. I, I can yeah. say that about all any of them because I, I know. Really? Yeah, they're all like, you know, what, what can this is what I can do for you, and they're like, do their hot shot pitch at you, like, oh, I'm gonna. I mean, I can think of some quotes either. I'm ready to take you guys over the mountain, man, over the cliff, you know? Oh, man. Like, things like that, like hot shot, blah, 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 you know? Um, so, I think Bruce, I think, gave us the best sales pitch, but, you know, mm -hmm. to his discredit, the week the record came out, like, he just quit his he quit his job. I, to this day, I've never heard from him, you know? The, the week our, like, the week or the month our record came out, he just disappeared. He didn't work there anymore. And when you don't have, like, your flag waiver at the label you're done man you're fucking done oh, it's like the man. nail in the coffin you know so we, we knew when once he was gone that the antenna like was pretty much dead in the water like the month after it came out as far as like the way major labels work you know because yeah. they're like you know the first single is going to be Anchor and we're not going to go straight to radio with it we're just going to make a video mm -hmm. but as soon as Bruce left like that whole plan's just gone and that shit with your radio like yeah no one likes that song I'm like yeah because it's a shitty song <laughs> you know and uh you know we could have told you that but you know uh -huh. it's these people think they have an idea you know and they think they know what what needs to be in place to set you to the next level, but you know, nine times out of ten, and we're learning now, you know, ten years later, that the music industry, you know, those decisions are poor and they don't know what they're talking about. You know, I read a couple magazine articles where you guys were saying part of the reason as well was Steven and his vocals. Is that true? Or? No, I mean, he, he I mean he could be hot and cold about the, you know. Like I said, we grew up together, so like yeah. things that like we said late, like years ago. We probably grew out of you know what I mean but yeah. I know Steve you know for a while wasn't into you know especially until your heart stops you know he said he you know it was hard for him to scream and sing for a whole set yeah. to the point where you know he wasn't he kind of resented it and also we were being kind of like pigeonholed as like a metalcore band 
and I wasn't very comfortable in that scene at all. You know, to this day, I'm not. You know, I, I, I have no, I don't care who's the heaviest band in the fucking world or the most tech man. I'm, I'm happy just being, you know, an individual, warts and all. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, and, you know, I have a much more indiv individualistic approach, but, you know, I think with Let's Hear Your Heart Stops, you're very much pigeonholed as a, like a metal band. And I wasn't comfortable with that, you know. And, Lots of violence at shows. And I, I, it just didn't feel natural, you know? So kind of encompassing all who we are. I think that's where Jupiter came out, you know? And that's where Steve changed his vocals. But, you know, now, I, I know, now especially growing up, you know, we, we spent three years apart. Come back, coming back to it, and Steve's screaming again. He's like, oh, this is fun. It's like therapeutic, you know? When you guys were writing Antenna, I mean, was, was there pressure from the label saying that you had to make a more commercial record? I mean, not in those sort of words, but, yeah. you know, they definitely wanted to hear some things that they liked. You know, they need something. To, I mean, I will say this. If it, you know, if you sign to a major label, your, your vision is compromised no matter what you say. And I know the Cavens was. Mm -hmm. um, you can't have people forking over thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to you without thinking, like, they're not going to have, like, hey, well, I think you should do this. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it, you'd be naive to think that you're going to get all this money for free and then do what you want, you know? Um, but, you know, they definitely wanted to hear things that they could push as singles, you know? Um, we had a producer, Rich Costi, and, you know, he definitely, we definitely made, like, you know, concise, there's definitely concise pop songs on that record. You know, labor, that record was very much labored over. There's versions and versions of some of those songs, which, again, I'll never do again. There's no reason to ever write five versions of one song. Yeah, and that dude's you know? big time, too. He's done, like, he's mixed a shitload. I mean, he's still, you know, he, I think he's, he's better off now than he was when we knew him. I mean, I know yeah. he's done the last few Muse records. He mixes all the Mars Volta records, which are great. I mean, Rich knows what he's talking. Rich knows what he's doing. Yeah. And I, I will never take anything away from him when he helped us make the record we wanted to make at that particular time, you know? But... And that's gone, man. It's like years ago now, you know? <laughs> was it hard when the record came out the way fans received it? Or your, your hardcore fans, you know? I mean, I don't even know who our hardcore fans are because even to this day, you know, people are like, I want to hear the Jupiter shit. No, I want to hear the Until Your Heart stuff shit. I mean, you'll hear it tonight, you know? Yeah. Like, you didn't play enough, you know, mellow stuff. You know, you didn't play enough heavy stuff. You can't really please anyone. And I, I don't care. I really, at this point, I don't. It's like years and years of people saying the same shit to me. And like, I just have a Frank Zappa approach, man. I, I'll just do whatever we want as long as we're comfortable, as long as we're having fun. As long as we're playing good, as long as the songs are still coming across, as long as like people will, you know, as long as I think that we're putting a good show on every night, I don't never want to go up there and suck. How does Hydra Head differ from RCA <laughs> versus Majors? I mean, you know, I mean, Majors like you're talking to like 46 people. RCA, I mean, RCA, you're talking to, like 46 people trying to get like one thing done. You have to talk to five people, and like Hydra Head, I can just call Mark and it's done. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's the difference. Really? Yeah. I mean, you know, major label, it's tons of hands in your pot stirring it, where independence, like, one-on-one, -on -one, you know exactly, you're both on the same page, because it's both in your interest to do well, where major, if you, fought, if you like, suck, they just write you off and move on, and they, they act like you never existed, you know? So. Well, how much did Jupiter cost, and how much did Antenna cost? I mean, Jupiter, we did in a week. Antenna, we did in four months. So, I mean, wow. do the math, you know? Dude. Seriously, I mean, even hundred bucks an hour in the studio. Yeah, I mean, and we did we did down the street at uh, Cello, which is where like, oh. Beach Boys recorded Pet Sounds. I mean, it wasn't fucking cheap, man. There was like runners to get food. I mean, it was major label money, man. I, I mean, I can't. I don't even want to know how much money was blown. I honestly don't even want to know. <laughs> when you were, you, I got to get back to the Dave Grohl jet thing. <laughs> did you did you feel like a rock star? No. Does I mean, you know, the four of us have always kept our feet on the ground. I, yeah. I really do believe, we never thought, we never believed our own hype, and never added up, you know, everyone always was like, you know, we've been told forever, even now, like, oh, Kevin just, like, you know, fit in anywhere, like, I feel like people are getting ready to discover it, I'm like, no, like, we've been told that since we started, and it's never really added up, we have a, a core group of, like, cult following that love us, and then there's people that love us and hate us, you know, depending upon what we put out, like, hot and cold, but, you know, I'm not, I mean, I don't, I don't think that, I never, like, think that we were going to be, like, What's up, man? rock Hi. stars. I'm Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Nice to meet you, I'm dude. JR. It's JR. JR, awesome. <laughs> Steve over there. Okay. That's Steve. Sorry for barging <laughs> oh, in. Oh, no, dude. Dude, <laughs> so you getting deep? Just talking about the old days, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have a hard time remembering it all. Yeah. I'm talking about the, uh, the Dave Grohl jet thing. Yeah, you wanted me like crazy oh, stories. Yeah, I'm, like, yeah. Yeah, I'm like, crazy stories, crazy stories. What's up, man? How you doing? I'm Ryan. Ryan? Steve, nice Steve, to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Yeah, man. yeah. We're just talking about the Dave Grohl jet. 
experience. Oh, <laughs> lots of champagne, yeah. rolling on the floor, uh, listening to Tom Petty, and um, the cars. And the cars, the cars yes. Uh, Flying over the fucking English Channel. And I, I remember that we were just sitting there drinking and smoking, and we were on an airplane, you know? Yeah, it's <laughs> it was really weird. Like, we, you know, we were landing and we weren't going to then. And, and it was awesome, too. We, like, got in, like, three unmarked white vans, pulled on the runway, yeah. got out, they took our bags, we walked up on the plane, <laughs> no security, flew to, into London, got off, yeah. walked on the <laughs> runway, and got in a taxi cab. Like, they didn't check any customs or anything. Man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Royal treatment. Yeah. That's crazy, man. For a day. But then he asked us, do you guys feel like rock stars? I'm like, no. I'm like, we always had our feet on the ground. We knew that we this will never happen again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Once, once only. Yeah, once in a lifetime. Yeah. Well, to change the, to change it from the uh, the highs, what were some of the low points in this band over the 15 <laughs> years? You know, were, were there times where you wanted to... Just as I just... come in here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, the biggest lows for me, I think, you know, when we kind of we kind of disintegrated after touring fucking too much, yeah. it was a mistake. I mean, on all our parts, we we should have all said no, but we just kind of kept on going. You know, and we just burnt ourselves out, burnt ourselves out. We, like we didn't, didn't like our band anymore. And now being back together, it's like man, it's crazy that we didn't like this. You know, because it's very natural for the four of us to play together. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's tough. You're under the influence when of uh, you know others' opinions. You know, in terms of the people you choose to work with, and you know the people we chose to work with really wanted the band just to be busy just for the sake of being busy yeah you know and that's because when a band is busy you know the people that the band is working for get paid yeah you know and the band doesn't <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah the band is the last to see money yeah. you know it's true so you know i think once we kind of got rid of that overhead of you know people who wanted to see the band just active simply for the sake of that you know, we're in the situation we're in now where we just, we do what we want to do because we're stoked about it, you know, and that's it. You know, if, if it's not, a, if it's not universal between the four of us, then it just doesn't happen, you know, and it doesn't have to happen. And we did cave in so intensely for so many years, and I think once we kind of disintegrated, we definitely all four of us need to like go off and grow up without each other. Yeah. I mean, we spent fucking years together, you know, and it's not that we didn't like each other, it's just kind of like we needed to do different stuff, you know. Whether it be family, wives, girlfriends, music, whatever it was, it's just I think all of us just need to grow a little bit without caving, you know? It, it was good for all of us. Caving yeah. started to eat us apart personally, and then because of that, it started to, you know, affect our relationship. With each other, yeah. you know? Yeah. So by the end of it, it was just, you know, we had to go our separate ways, or it would have just, it would have been worse than what it was, yeah. <laughs> you know? So. That I, was probably the lowest point. <laughs> <laughs> I asked Adam this earlier, but for you guys, what do you do now? You know, I mean, I know you do a lot of side projects, pet sounds, and um, wait, that is what pet, pet genius. genius. <laughs> <laughs> We're just talking about the Beach Boys. Oh yeah, so, oh, okay. <laughs> almost as good as pet. Al yeah. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, and uh, and you have a uh, you do solo stuff too. Yeah, yeah. So, I do. Um, you know, kind of like what Adam was saying. You know, just branching off and playing with other people and developing your life in other ways you know I think musically you know we've all kind of done that and you know I've gotten a good opportunity to play with you know other great musicians as well mm -hmm. and um, you know Pet Genius, the Octave Museum um, you know even doing some of my solo stuff a little bit more seriously was you know healthy for me in certain ways and you know sobering learning experience in other ways and you know, it all just kind of amounts to the bigger picture in the end. Yeah, and I, I did Pet Genius as well with Steve. Okay. And then uh, on top of that, I'm currently in another band called Doom Riders, um, which is a pretty busy band. Um, and then besides that, I just go home and work, and I have a little girl, and, you know, so I live the domestic life when I'm not doing this, you know. So it makes things challenging when, when I do need to do music, but... Now, in my, in the, at this point in my life, everything is worth something. Yeah. I'm not just doing things for the hell of it. You know? you get my name so, out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need recognition or anything. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a good spot to be in. You know, I have a lot of responsibility, but it's all things that matter a whole lot to me. You know? <laughs> when you guys were heavy in touring, was it a focus to always get your name out there? Was that... 
Uh, I think it was for other people surrounding the band. Okay. Uh, you know, we... There were some tours we did that I thought was worth it, but like, we were yeah. on some tours, I'm like, what the fuck am I doing here? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know it's, it doesn't feel good, man. You know, it's like a long days of your life sitting there like every like I hate this fucking band I don't like these people yeah. and I'm just here to make money and like be on this tour I'm know? not even making that much money yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean it was cool for a while because we could just you know we could say that we're living off music you know we we didn't have to work day jobs and all we did was play music but you know by the end of that like two and a half three years it was just it wasn't worth it to do that you know, because we were just slowly killing ourselves so, uh, it wasn't satisfying. It wasn't adding up. Yeah. It wasn't like there was a demand for people to see Caven as much as we were out there at all. I mean, I, I think that we wanted <laughs> yeah. to get our name out to the point where you know we would have good shows. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, the phrase "getting your name out there" for the people that were working around us it was just they wanted to make us massive, you know, like a massive band. And I think we just kind of realized that it wasn't going to happen that way, but. At that point, we didn't really think, or we couldn't really make any changes to it. To, to I think we were just so wrapped up. Yeah, well, it was a rat race because, you know, when we signed to RCA, there was this whole plan that was laid out. Like, here's the first single. We'll let that build up to the second single, which we'll, you know, we'll release, you know, four or five months later, and then the third single, which is the breakout single. And then you guys will be headlining arenas, you know, and we'll all be driving our convertibles, you know, that kind of bullshit. So basically, you know, in, in these steps that were laid out to, for this band to, like, you know, be a corporate success, um, you know, we didn't, like, hit it off right away with the first single. And then our A&R guy left, like, within a month of our record coming out. And because it wasn't a home run right off the bat, and you know, people in that industry, you know, they, they don't have patience, you know? It's either immediate or it's like, oof, you know, in most cases. And for us, it just, you know, it didn't happen right away. So, you know, uh, we ended up suffering as a band because of that. We were signed like a new set of people. And they're like, you know, yeah. you guys are like a million dollars in debt. And this next record has to be it. And, yeah. You know, Clive Davis took over RCA and he's like, you know, we want Clive to be into this. And I'm like, oh, wow. The guy who signed Mariah Carey, I'm like, honestly, I don't give a fuck about Clive Davis. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I'm like, <gasps> <You know? laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just don't. You know, Bad Brain's cool. I love it. You know? Wow. We, went, we went from years and years of planning everything on our own, uh -huh. doing things our own way, to having other people try and tell us what we should be doing to get our name out there. You know? And uh, we went along with it because, you know, I think that. There was a little naivety. <laughs> it's a hard word, but you know, I, I, I don't think you know. We really tried to think it through and think of all the different aspects of being on a major and having that sort of life. But you know, nothing can prepare you for it unless you live through it. And, Tons of money was wasted too. Yeah, there's a lot of things that we didn't think about. You yeah. Know, that we missed when we were thinking about all the things that we should have been thinking about. You know? And well, you were saying you were talking about Anchor. You didn't want that to be the first single. I mean, he says the first single. I'm like, this is the weakest song on the record. I remember saying that. I'm like, that's my opinion. Is that that's the weakest song on the record? It's like, no, this is the one. Yeah, there were like three other songs that I would rather have put out as a first single. Which ones? Uh, <laughs> I mean, if I was gonna go first, I would say Inspire. But going back to that, you know? yeah. I mean, Inspire it's or... funny to talk about it now. I know, right? This, yeah. shit's, this is like water under the bridge, man, Seriously, you know? yeah. And who knows? I, mean, I don't even if, care, you even know? The, the ones that we picked, if they would have done any any better, you know? Yeah, I mean, so. who knows and who cares at this point? Yeah. 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 You said that Jupiter was recorded in a week and that Antenna was recorded in four months. Yeah. Um, so there was a lot more nitty-gritty picking, I imagine, than with, <laughs> with Antenna. Oh, yeah. we, we finished, yeah, we finished Antenna and then uh, all the guitars were tracked and finalized and then you know oh here's a new amp that uh you know was discovered let's redo all the guitar tracks and blow another two weeks in the studio wow. you know and uh we had the drums set up in one room for probably a good week and a half and then it just didn't work so we had to switch them all and do everything over and, and then before we even went into the studio we did like two weeks of pre-production and it was just like you know going into a practice space every day all day long playing the songs over and over and over again and we didn't really have to do that. There were days we went to the practice space and just laid down and went to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And our manager was calling you guys to the practice. We're like, yep. We just hang up. <laughs> <laughs> so what made you go back to Hydrahead after all that? 
it's family. They just, yeah, it's family, and they're like, come on back, losers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll take you Crawl back. Crawl back yeah, to yeah, us. Back. <laughs> it was really good of them to, to take us back. <laughs> I mean, it's very natural. We've known those guys, you know, since I've been Aaron when I was like 16 years old. So, uh -huh. you know, we, we business got a little mucked up during the major label era of Caven. But, I mean, I think because we had a long history together, you know, that shit doesn't even matter anymore, you know? Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, it's true. I mean, you, you find out who your friends are and you go through shit like that, you know? Like, all those people that are, of this era that we're talking about, we don't speak to any of those people anymore. But yeah. all our old guard, we very much are all connected to Converge guys, a hydrate guys, the ISIS guy. We're all connected to all those guys still to this day, yeah. you know? Yeah. They didn't drop us like bad habits and act like we didn't exist, you yeah. know? <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the uh, the vinyl release that you guys put out in July, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How was the recording process for that? I imagine not Did four it one months. night. Quick and easy. One night. Yeah. Yeah. Well, two nights, actually. Yeah, yeah one night music, second night vocals. Did yeah. you do it all analog? Well, I mean, it's on vinyl. Uh, no, no, it was, it was Pro Tools. Pro Tools? Pro yeah. Tools? But we uh, we went in and did it live. You know, we we wrote the songs and practiced them for probably about what three, four months, something like that. And it was, you know, the songs were very fresh. We didn't do anything besides work on those four songs. So when we went in to record it, you know, we set everything up, played it live, and it went very natural. Came in song, I think, is the first take. Yeah. Oh, yeah. uh, Air Escapes as well. Yeah, first yeah. take was quick. I, that's the way I want to do it, man. Yeah, uh -huh. That's the way I, yeah, one night it should take. It's all, <laughs> you know it's all we can afford at this point. It's yeah. all we can afford. <laughs> and you know, the way, it's the way bands used to do things, man. You know, I, I'm inspired by bands that go in, like, banging out and they're done. You know, it's like, you don't, four months just sucks the life out of everything yeah. and everyone. Yeah. I mean, you know? you know, there's no pedal or piece of gear that can create, like, the energy of a band recording live and, and just getting it done as quick as possible. You know? Yeah, there's definitely a certain ambience with some when a band does that all it's an energy live. Too, yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing, tracking, when you track a record, it's like, you know, once you do your take, you sit there and listen to it and pick it apart, you know? Yeah. Instead of listening for the whole, you know, the overall vibe of the, the song. You know? So when we did it live, we just recorded it, and if it sounded great, it was, it was good enough. Yeah, know? I mean, we practice every week. I hear the same songs every week, you know? There's no reason to play a, a song to the to the death in the studio just because you're in front of a bunch of microphones and someone's running a board, you know? Yeah. 